members, the library, the staff, the participants in the conference, members of the audience, ladies and gentlemen. When Professor Simon and Professor Thora came to the Supreme Court of India to invite me to deliver the keynote address for the sixth international conference on the unfinished legacy of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, I was curious to know what this conference was all about. What was the idea behind its inception? And how did a university in the United States get involved in organizing an annual academic conference dedicated to Dr. Babasaheb Ambedkar, popularly known as the chief architect of the Indian constitution and an inspiration to millions of people in India and around the world? Professor Simon and Professor Thorat passionately told me that the conference was instituted in 2015 and that there have been five editions of the conference prior to the one which we are attending right now and one of the main objectives of the conference is to address issues around caste. I was told that Brandeis University, named after Justice Louis Brandeis, is committed to social justice and in furtherance of its goals has been at the helm of running a couple of initiatives focusing on social inequalities in South Asia. Apart from this conference, the Center for Global Development and Sustainability of the University, headed by Professor Simon, in collaboration with Professor Thorat in India, also runs an academic journal titled Past, a Global Journal on Social Exclusion. And it organizes a Bluestone Rising Scholar Award for promoting research in areas related to social inequalities. I'm here as much in terms of my own personal tribute to Dr. Babasaheb Ambedkar, whose life, whose work, whose vision has deeply influenced me as a human being and now as a judge. I also use this occasion to celebrate the award which was conferred on my very distinguished former law clerk, Anurag Bhaskar, who is now working at the Center for Research and Planning in the Supreme Court of India. <coughs> The theme for this year's edition of the conference is Law, Caste and the Pursuit of Justice. As the theme revolves around law, this may be the reason that I have been invited today to deliver a keynote address at the conference. But I will follow in the footsteps of Justice Louis Brandeis, who became well known globally for the Brandeis brief. Because as judges, we have to be increasingly cognizant of social reality and to understand that the law itself does not exist in a vacuum. The law exists because of and has a direct connect with society and what better way to begin this than by a reference to Dr. Ambedkar himself. I must say that I am delighted to be invited to deliver this keynote, more so as a conference in a way pays a tribute to the legacy of Dr. Ambedkar, whom we all see as a guiding light, as a beacon. I also share a personal connection with Dr. Ambedkar. When my father, late Chief Justice Y.B. Chandrachur, was a young lawyer, he would often go to a cafe close to the Bombay High Court called the Wayside Inn at Kalagura. He always saw a man sitting there the entire afternoon, writing down, writing down his thoughts and making notes. My father would actually use the word furiously making notes and writing down his thoughts. That man was none other than Baba Sahib Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, who would spend afternoons between court cases writing his notes for the Constituent Assembly and his thoughts for the ultimate constitution that he was going to be an architect for. My father also appeared against Dr. Ambedkar in a case involving an electricity dispute. The title of my keynote address is Reformation Beyond Representation, the social life of the constitution in remedying historical wrongs. In my address, I shall largely be referring to the Indian constitution, but I will make references to the American constitution where necessary. Before proceeding, I will briefly outline the contours of my address today. I intend to begin by discussing what we understand by historical wrongs. What do we mean by the very concept of historical wrongs? I shall discuss what the role of law was in the era of historical wrongs, 
I will then speak about how leaders such as Dr. Ambedkar conceptualized an alternative framework of, eman of emancipatory constitutionalism to address these historical wrongs. I will discuss how the idea of representation was an essential ingredient of remedying historical wrongs. However, representation is only one way of remedying what was historically wrong. Today I want to look beyond representation. There has been a constitutional discourse on social reformation apart from the idea of representation. I shall discuss how the courts play a crucial role in this regard. At the end, I shall discuss why the discourse on reformation must not be limited to courtrooms and must be considered in the canvas of the larger, larger social discourse on equality. But let me begin with historical norms. Throughout history, marginalized social groups have been subjected to horrendous, egregious wrongs, often stemming from prejudice, discrimination, and unequal power dynamics. From the brutal transatlantic slave trade that forcibly uprooted millions of Africans to the Native American displacement, to the caste inequalities in India affecting millions of backward, though Bahujan castes, to the oppression of indigenous Adivasi communities in India, to the systemic oppression of women, LGBTQI individuals, and other minority communities, the annals of history are stained with instances of profound injustice. These wrongs have caused immeasurable suffering and have left lasting scars on these communities, underscoring the urgent need for societal reflection, reconciliation, and efforts to rectify past injustice in the ongoing quest for a more equitable and inclusive world. What sets apart these wrongs is that they deny the core truth of human equality. Reasonable people, governments and courts can disagree over various aspects of human rights, such as questions of privacy and personal liberty. However, the historical wrongs I discuss deny individuals their right to participate in and reap the benefits of living together in society based on the identity of the individual. Bahujan castes were denied access to public spaces and slaves were denied their very liberty based on nothing beyond who they were by the color of their skin. Such wrongs pertain not to what rights people have but rather who constitutes the demos capable of claiming rights from society. Thus, when I say historical wrongs, it is not just about individual bad actions of a few individuals, but social systems and arrangements of identity-based exclusion that go against the very grain and idea of human equality and what may be considered a just and fair society. Unfortunately, the legal system has often played a pivotal role in perpetuating historical wrongs against marginalized social groups. Like in the United States, slavery was legalized in certain parts of India as well. P. Sanal Mohan in his book titled Modernity of Slavery, Struggles Against Caste Inequality in Colonial Kerala, highlights experiences of several oppressed castes who were enslaved in the erstwhile Indian princely state of Travancore and in other states. This slavery was only abolished in 1855. But even before that, the laws in ancient and medieval India had sanctions against communities whom we now call as Dalits or the scheduled castes. Dr. Ambedkar himself highlighted how the policies of the Peshwa regime discriminated against oppressed castes in the annihilation of caste. The colonial rule was no better in India. The Colonial Era Criminal Tribes Act of 1871 criminalized indigenous tribes, several castes, and eunuchs by declaring them as born criminals. The British colonial courts, as Mark Galanter 
has eloquently traced in his essay called Law and Caste in Modern India, refused to rule in favor of oppressed castes when it came to matters of personal law and religious custom. In the United States, from the codification of discriminatory laws that supported the institution of slavery to the Jim Crow laws enforcing segregation in the American South to the forced assimilation policies targeting indigenous peoples, the legal framework has frequently been weaponized to systematically oppress and marginalize certain communities. The judgments of the US Supreme Court were aggressive on several instances, including Dred Scott in 1857, Lessie B. Ferguson, which was in 1896, and Kuremansu. In, 1950, in 1944, during the Second World War. Furthermore, both in the United States and in India, the oppressed communities were denied voting rights for a long period of time. In that way, law as an institution was used to maintain existing power structures and to institutionalize discrimination, leaving a lasting legacy of injustice that continues to shape the lives of these groups and communities. Even when these laws have been eventually overturned or repealed, the legacy of that harms can persist for generations, underscoring the complex and enduring relationship between law and historical wrongs committed against marginalized groups. These historical wrongs perpetuate injustice by creating a social system where the marginalized communities are not allowed to rise above their oppression. It creates a kind of self-perpetuating and hierarchical structure of society, which leads to the normalization of injustice towards certain groups. This normalization can creep up to the instances where the alienation of these communities makes them the other in society. Otherness can then create a rift of violence and exclusion of these communities as well. For instance, historical marginalization leads to exclusion in accumulating resources or capital that ought to be equally distributed in society. This exclusion leads to difficulties in overcoming marginalization, even if there has been a recognition of historical wrongs. Consequently, it becomes imperative for the institutional setup of constitutional democracies to make sure that safeguards to these communities are upheld and policies are made for the upliftment of these communities. Recognizing these historical injustices underscores the crucial role of legal reform and the need for a just and inclusive legal system to address past wrongs and work towards a more equitable society. Let me, in the second part of my address, refer to emancipatory constitutionalism. What do we mean by emancipatory constitutionalism? What are its potentials? Remedying historical wrongs ought to be the goal of any constitutional system. This has been emphasized by leaders from the oppressed communities who interpreted constitutionalism from the lens of social change. Indeed, using the British Constitution at the time and contemporary state constitutions as a baseline, Akhil Amar read in his very notable text called the America's Constitution of Biography, outlines the methods through which the American Constitution rejected historical bases for wielding power and exercising franchise such as hereditary titles and property ownership that were the norm at the time. However, the framers of the US Constitution failed to remedy the issue of slavery. This was questioned by Frederick Douglass, American abolitionist and social reformer, in a speech before the Scottish Anti-Slavery Society in Glasgow, Scotland, on 26 March 1860. Douglas outlined his views on the American Constitution and stated, I deny, he said, I deny that the Constitution guarantees the right to hold property in man 
and believe that the way to abolish slavery in America is to hold such men into power as well as use their powers for the abolition of slavery. In India, the constitutional imagination of equality was done by Dr. Ambedkar. Dr. Ambedkar envisaged a form of constitutionalism that was deeply rooted in democratic principles, social justice, and the protection of individual rights. His vision for the Indian constitution was shaped by his commitment to ending the deeply entrenched social injustices and discriminations prevalent in Indian society. In several of his writings, he advanced a transformative constitutionalism that aimed to address the historical injustices and systemic discrimination faced by the marginalized and oppressed communities in India. His vision was rooted in the principles of equality, social justice, and the protection of fundamental rights. In his classic yet undelivered address, which he later published as The Annihilation of Caste in 1936, Dr. Ambedkar stated, if you ask me, he said, my ideal would be a society based on liberty, equality, and fraternity. Later, Dr. Ambedkar brought these values in the language of the Constitution itself from the preamble across the entire canvas of the Indian Constitution. Dr. Ambedkar tried to institutionalize social revolution through law. He believed that a just and inclusive society could be achieved through a robust legal framework that would safeguard the rights and dignity of all citizens, particularly those from historically disadvantaged backgrounds. That is the reason why he held a different approach with the other leaders of Indian independence, who focused on political freedom without addressing social freedoms. But Dr. Ambedkar's political freedom was neither an end in itself nor complete or sufficient in itself. And to him, freedom would lack the core of its soul unless freedom came with social freedom. And he wrote, political reform cannot with impunity take precedence over social reform in the sense of the reconstruction of society. The makers of political constitutions must take into account social forces as well. Thus, in Dr. Ambedkar's conceptualization, the idea of a constitution goes beyond its traditional role as a mere set of rules and principles for governance. It extended the constitution's capacity to liberate and empower marginalized and oppressed groups. The emancipatory idea of the constitution, which Dr. Ambedkar advanced, sought to address historical injustices, challenge systems of discrimination, and advance the cause of emancipation and equality. Furthermore, Dr. Ambedkar's constitutionalism aimed at creating a robust framework of checks and balances, where the constitution would serve as a bulwark against potential abuses of state power, ensuring the protection of the rights of all citizens, one of the key aspects of Dr. Ambedkar's constitutionalism was the inclusion of affirmative action measures known as reservations in India to uplift historically disadvantaged groups. For several decades, he advocated for incorporation of mandatory affirmative action provisions into the constitution. Dr. Ambedkar believed that such measures would help rectify historical injustices by providing opportunities and representation to the marginalized. He called mandatory affirmative action a form of separation of power. Today, the non-discrimination and affirmative action are often differentiated by references to a negative and positive form of liberty. Arguments that the state ought to abstain from discriminating are distinguished from a positive command or mandate to uplift individuals who have suffered from historical wrongs. It is also argued that affirmative action is fundamentally contrary to the idea of equality or colorblind equality 
at the least, you find traces of that rationale, not only in India, but in the US as well, including in recent times. In countries such as India, where affirmative action is actively pursued, non-discrimination and affirmative action are also differentiated through institutional roles between parliament and the judiciary. It is argued that it is the court's duty to enforce non-discrimination norms, but mandates for affirmative action are left as questions for elected officials. However, Dr. Ambedkar did not view equality and affirmative action as contradictory. This is because he conceived equality and liberty as intrinsically connected norms. Notions of negative freedom contemplate freedom from interference. However, as Republican scholars have argued for centuries, the idea of freedom as the absence of state restrictions fails to recognize the difference between being free from interference and being free to act. Using the classical Republican example, a slave may never be put in a cage or beaten, but that does not make them free to act. Negative conceptions of freedom characterize liberty as the absence of episodic interference. For after all, interference is inherently temporary. When a person is in prison, they are not free. When they are released, they are free. However, such negative conceptions of freedom ignore the ongoing deprivations that can arise out of dominating relationships or societal arrangements outside of episodic interferences with liberty. An individual may not be in prison, but the social, legal and economic structures that govern their lives lead to domination on the side of caste, race, gender, disability or economic well-being. In the annihilation of caste, he characterizes liberty as the destruction of the dominion which one man holds over another. He argued that if the source of power and dominion is at any given point of time or in any given society, social and religious, then social reform and religious reform must be accepted as the necessary sort of reform. That is, even where domination is the result of actions by non-state actors or so structural societal arrangements, liberty is at risk and must be remedied through by the state. After all, liberty does not mean liberty to discriminate. By characterizing liberty as relational and not episodic, Dr. Ambedkar conceived of liberty and equality as two sides of the same coin. For him, ensuring liberty required ensuring that every person in a society had sufficient standing that they were not dominated, whether that be through economic, social or religious power. Unlike narrower conceptions of liberty that seek solely to prevent episodic state intervention, Conceiving of freedom as non-domination allows the very site of state intervention to be liberty generating by eradicating the sources of dominating power. Thus, Dr. Ambedkar conceived of a reformative movement that was simultaneously interventionist, yet liberty enhancing. This is not to say that Dr. Ambedkar ignored the risks of excessive state intervention his vision also encompassed the establishment of an independent judiciary that would serve as a guardian of the constitution, interpreting and upholding its principles. He famously called Article 32 of the Indian Constitution, which provides the citizens the right to move the Supreme Court as the heart and the soul of the constitution. In a sense, his vision for constitutionalism emphasized not only the protection of fundamental rights, but also the active protection and promotion of social equality and justice.
making it a cornerstone of modern India's democratic framework. The Indian Constitution in 1950 incorporated a set of fundamental rights such as the right to equality, the right to freedom from discrimination, and the right to equal protection under the law. Apart from affirmative action, the most important impact of Dr. Ambedkar's formulation was Article 17, which abolishes untouchability and was placed in the chapter of fundamental rights, along with the provisions of equality and non-discrimination. It was hoped that these provisions would break the shackles of caste-based discrimination and untouchability, fostering a more equitable and harmonious society. After its adoption, the Indian constitution has interacted with the society in different ways. I have used Article 17 and the quest against untouchability and I have ex extrapolated it in the context of laws or customs which excluded women of a menstruating age from worship in temples. In the third part of my address this afternoon, let me focus on the impact of the Indian constitution. The social life of a constitution refers to how a constitution functions within a society, its impact on the daily lives of citizens, how citizens perceive it, and its adaptability to changing social, political, and cultural dynamics. The phrase social life recognizes that a constitution is not just a static legal document, but a living framework that interacts with and shapes the social and political environment in which it operates. In a sense, the social life of a constitution is about how the constitution functions within the broader context of society, impacting not only the legal and political spheres, but also the cultural and economic and other social aspects of the lives of our citizens. It reflects the dynamic and evolving nature of constitutional governance as it responds to the needs and values of the people it serves. The adoption of the constitution, the Indian constitution, was seen as a moment of a tectonic shift in Indian history. American historian Granville Austin traveled to India to document the process of drafting India's constitution. In his classic book, The Indian Constitution, Cornerstone of a Nation, Austin termed the Indian Constitution a social revolutionary statement. By its very existence, he said, a modernizing force. Austin narrated, and I quote him, Representative government with adult suffrage, a bill of rights providing for equality under law and personal liberty, and an independent judiciary were to become the spiritual and institutional basis for a new society. One replacing the traditional hierarchy and its repressions. Other constitutional provisions were designed to spread democracy by protecting and increasing the rights of minorities by assisting underprivileged groups in society to better their condition and by ending the blatant oppression of the scheduled castes and tribes. These provisions have brought into or closer to the mainstream of society, individuals and groups that would otherwise have remained at society's bottom or its edges. In that sense, the constitution attempted to replace fundamental wrongs with fundamental rights. Affirmative action and representation were a crucial component of constitutional foundations laid down in India. As mentioned earlier, Dr. Ambedkar fought to the nail to get the provisions of affirmative action incorporated into the Indian constitution. It was Dr. Ambedkar's belief that the oppressed should have their own representation and that representation would develop political conscience among these communities. Dr. Ambedkar stated that the British colonial rule over Indians was morally wrong. Then in the same way, the rule of oppressor castes over the oppressed was equally wrong. This again highlights Dr. Ambedkar's idea of freedom as relational. He saw no difference between the actions of a colonial power in jailing political prisoners 
and the denial of access to public resources by the oppressor class. What matter was a dominating relationship between the two individuals concerned? While the British departed in 1947, the dominating effects of caste oppression subsisted. Since independence, affirmative action policies in India have offered crucial support to oppressed social groups by providing them with opportunities for education, employment, and representation that might otherwise be inaccessible due to deeply entrenched inequalities. As noted in the judgment of the Supreme Court of India in Indra Sani versus Union of India in 1992, the objective was to change the social face as it shall advance public welfare by demolishing rigidity of caste, promoting representation of those who till now were kept away, thus providing status to them, restoring balance in society, reducing poverty, and increasing the distribution of benefits and advantages to one and all. In theory as well as in practice, these policies serve as a means to level the playing field, granting access to opportunities that may have been systematically denied in the past, by actively including underrepresented individuals in education and employment sectors, affirmative action, helps bring down barriers, it develops a psychological assurance that individuals from marginalized backgrounds have a shot at achieving their full potential and contributing to the collective well-being of the community. Looking at the statistics, the representation of constitutionally protected social groups or the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes has increased in the government services under various categories over the last seven decades. At the dawn of independence, representation of the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes and services was marginal. According to available information, as on 1 January 1965, the representation of the scheduled castes in the Group A of government services, which are the top level bureaucratic posts, was just 1.64%, which increased to 13.21% as on 1 January 2022. Likewise, the representation of the scheduled tribes as on 1 January 1965 in the Group A post was 0.27%. It has increased to 6.01% as on 1 January 2022. This is the direct impact of the Constitution. The presence of marginalized communities and services, education, and in political representation is in itself a realization of our constitutional mandate. This is how the social presence of the oppressed communities demonstrates the success of the social life of the constitution in a way that is being implemented. Furthermore, the oppressed communities in India used the vocabulary of the Indian constitution with a focus on equality and affirmative action to mobilize and reclaim their sense of dignity. The constitution of India legitimized the obvious personhood of the oppressed communities. But above all, let us remember that Dr. Ambedkar and his vision were responsible for replacing what would have been a culture of violence with a culture grounded in the constitution and the rule of law. Social transformation therefore became a peaceful transformation using the instruments of the constitution to further social change. This was one way to facilitate and empower individuals from marginalized backgrounds to break free from cycles of oppression and help in rectifying historical injustice. Moreover, it has sent a clear message that society is committed to correcting systematic biases and working towards greater equality, ultimately fostering a more just and inclusive environment for all. Let me next dwell in the next segment on the limits around affirmative action. The mere presence of the members of 
oppressive groups of oppressed groups in government services must not be seen as the only parameter to analyze the power structures of society. Let's take the example of a press release which stated, and I quote, the representation of the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in the posts and services under the central government as on 1 January 2016 was 17.49% and 8.47% respectively. Representation of the SEs and STs is more than the prescribed percentage of reservation, 15% and 7%. That's the press note which I have quoted. However, this press release does not mention how many scheduled castes are in top decision-making positions in government and how many in the lowest level positions. The real question, therefore, is what the representation of the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in top positions is. The statistics show that out of a total of 322 officers currently holding the posts of joint secretaries and secretaries, which are top level bureaucratic posts in our civil service, in different ministries and departments under the government of India, only 16 belong to scheduled castes which is 4.9% of the total posts and only 13 belong to scheduled tribes, which is only 4%. These statistics, in other words, show that focusing only on the total number of employees rather than examining how many scheduled castes and tribes hold top positions is misleading. Reformation beyond representation entails ensuring that marginalized and underrepresented communities not only have a seat at the table, but they also that they have a meaningful voice in decision-making processes. There is also a concern that in spaces where representation is not legally mandated, representation must not be confused with diversity. It has been stated by scholars that the sole focus on diversity can lead to tokenism where individuals from underrepresented groups are viewed as symbols of diversity rather than being valued for their skills and their qualifications. This can undermine their professional and personal growth. Ellen Berry, through his book titled The Enigma of Diversity, The Language of Race and the Limits of Racial Justice of 2015, has struck a chord of caution that the invocation of diversity must not be reduced to tokenism. She argues, diversity advocates efforts to minimize group divisions and expand the bounds of social membership have focused on symbolism more than on social causes. Much discourse on diversity leaves advocates without a language for talking about inequality. Diversity, therefore, needs to be understood from the perspective of representation and social discrimination. Institutions need to be more diverse because communities that have been subjected to historical discrimination are underrepresented. Thus, as in India, historical wrongs form an independent justification for affirmative action irrespective of concerns of promoting diversity. The idea of representation through affirmative action must be facilitated by discourse on broader systemic issues such as unequal access to quality education for everyone. Affirmative action in itself cannot solve the issue of universal education. Rather, it is connected to universal education. When a greater number of people from oppressed groups would gain education, their presence in institutions through affirmative action will increase. That is when the full potential of affirmative action will be seen. Thus, social reformation involves dismantling systemic barriers and addressing structural inequality. This would encompass reforms in education, healthcare, criminal justice, and economic systems that have historically disadvantaged certain groups.
even the slightest success of affirmative action is used by caste elites to dismiss the issues around caste inequalities. Arguments are advanced that just because affirmative action is being provided, structural issues of discrimination don't exist anymore at all. Such binary narrations must be rejected, and I believe rejected at the constitutional level and at the social level as well. Affirmative action and prevention of caste discrimination in India or racial discrimination or remedying different forms of injustice are complementary to each other. They are not different poles, rather they are intersecting phenomena. That is to say, social transformation requires different, several different measures at the same time. Therefore, apart from emphasizing solely on affirmative action and representation, the constitutional and social discourse must also engage in reflecting on a wider range of methods to remedy historical wrongs. Reformation beyond representation means that the mere presence of diverse groups within a political or administrative system is not enough, that it extends to a deeper transformation of power, policies and social structures is what matters. It emphasizes the need for substantive change in the way societies and governments operate. It is in this context that reformation of our society is an aspect in which the Constitution has played such a crucial role. Let me in the latter part now of my presentation deal with the potential of the Constitution. A broader framework of constitutionalism underscores the transformative potential of constitutional law to provide social justice and human rights. This approach often involves interpreting and applying constitutional provisions in ways that actively work to correct historical wrongs and to promote a more inclusive and equitable society, thereby serving as a vital tool for social progress and the realization of fundamental rights. After independence, there are several judgments of the Supreme Court of India which challenge structural barriers. I would like to mention just a few recent judgments. The court in Navkate Singh Johar vs. Union of India decriminalized consensual sexual conduct between individuals of the same sex. The court noted that the ability of a society to acknowledge the injustice which it has perpetrated is a mark of its evolution. The court further held that for those who have been oppressed, justice under a regime committed to human freedom has the power to transform lives and that the constitution has within it the ability to produce a social catharsis. In another important judgment, in Indian Young Lawyers Association versus Union of versus State of Kerala in 2018, while deciding on the case of exclusion of women from the Sabrimala temple due to a long-standing religious practice, the, the court held that discriminatory practices cannot be allowed merely due to it being a custom. Even though the case has been pending for reconsideration, it is important to note that the judgment acknowledged that the constitution of India is the end product of not just a struggle against colonial rule, but also a struggle of social emancipation going on since centuries, which still continues. The struggle for emancipation, the court noted, has been the struggle for the replacement of an unequal social order and a fight for undoing historical injustice and for righting fundamental wrongs with fundamental rights. A challenge to an affirmative action policy was adjudicated in BK Pavitra versus Union of India in 2019. In deciding the case, our court observed that for equality to be truly effective, or substantive, the principle must recognize existing inequalities in society to overcome them, and that reservations or affirmative action policies are the true fulfillment of effective and substantive equality 
by accounting for the structural conditions in which people are born. In another case, titled Babita Punya vs. Secretary Ministry of Defense of 2020, the Supreme Court of India ruled in favor of the permanent commission of women officers in the Indian Army. It was followed in the Indian Air Force and Indian Navy as well. Pursuant to the judgment, the Indian Army applied the same physical evaluation criteria that a male officer would have to pass to get permanent permission at the age of 25 to women officers who are seeking permission, permanent commission at the age of 45 or 50. This was challenged before the Supreme Court in the case of Lieutenant Colonel Nitisha versus the Union of India. Our court held that applying identical physical evaluation criteria to both women and men, men who were in their 20s and women who had been denied the opportunity to apply for permanent commission until they were much later in life, constituted indirect and systemic discrimination against the women officers. The court held that a systemic view of discrimination in perceiving discriminatory disadvantage as a continuum would account for not just unjust action but also inaction and that structures in the form of organizations or otherwise ought to be probed for the systems or cultures they produce that influence day-to-day -day interaction and decision making. Our court held that the duty of constitutional courts is also structure adequate reliefs and remedies that facilitate social redistribution by providing for positive entitlements that aim to negate the scope of future harm. Taking note of the oppression against the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, our court in Hariram Bhambi v. Satinarayan in 2021, while adjudicating a bail matter of a person who was accused of committing, committing caste-based violence, held that atrocities against members of the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes are not a thing of the past. They continue to be a reality in our society even today. Hence, the statutory provisions which have been enacted by Parliament as a measure of protecting the constitutional rights of persons belonging to the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes must be complied with and enforced conscientiously. These judgments show the transformative potential of the Constitution and the active role of courts. But it would be wrong to say that judgments such as the ones I have referred to above are not always the case. Some of the judgments have been criticized for being regressive and have been overturned for the right reasons. As I come to the last part of my address this afternoon, let me deal briefly with social law versus constitutional law. The arguments in courtrooms also demonstrate that there is a, con there's a constant tussle and that tussle is between constitutional aspects of the law and entrenched social practices. We can, we can understand this as a gap between the aspirational values of the constitution and the social realities of the day. Dr. Ambedkar had termed social practices as a law within itself, imposing social sanctions and violence on those who do not comply. Thus, in addition to the constitutional and legal sovereignty that governs people, there also resides a governing power in various social and cultural institutions that determines how people actually lead their lives. While constitutional principles often embody ideals of justice, equality, and human rights, deeply ingrained social norms and practices can sometimes run counter to these principles. This clash between constitutional doctrine and social practice is particularly evident in cases involving issues like gender equality, religious freedom, and caste discrimination. For instance, despite constitutional guarantees of gender equality, deeply rooted patriarchal customs may persist, leading to gender-based discrimination and violence. Similarly, 
Despite legislation prohibiting caste-based discrimination, incidents of violence against protected communities are on the rise. Courts and legal systems often find themselves at the center of this tension as they must interpret and apply the law in a manner that respects constitutional principles. This challenge calls for a nuanced approach, including legal reforms, public education, and advocacy efforts aimed at shifting societal norms in alignment with constitutional ideals. It is an ongoing struggle to ensure that constitutional principles are upheld even in the face of deeply entrenched practices that may hinder progress towards a more just and equitable society. And then finally, the Constitution outside courtrooms. For social reformation to happen, the discourse needs to extend beyond courtrooms and judges. And you might find it surprising that a judge says that. This is why the topic of my address contains the phrase the social life of the Constitution. Of course, the Constitution is a terrain of struggle. But lawyers arguing in courts are not saviors in themselves or operate in a vacuum. They build on the work of scholars, community leaders, and activists, and all other stakeholders. The role of the citizens in constitutional adjudication has to be highlighted. As Isa J. Shivji, a Tanzanian author and expert in law, notes, it must be acknowledged that legal struggles are only one front of the social struggles of the working people. Therefore, they cannot be waged in isolation from other battlefronts. He adds that other sites of struggle include mobilization among people. Constitution historian and scholar Michael Klum notes that several civil rights lawyers did work outside the courtroom, educating the African American community about their rights under the American Constitution. In India, right from the adoption of the Constitution, the people of India have engaged with it in different ways. While, when, while one set of elites critique the constitution as a document of foreign inspirations, the oppressed social groups have used the language of the constitution to demand their rights. The social life of the constitution, in that sense, is not in courtrooms, but in how the values of the constitution are perceived by society. For instance, the amount, the enormous amount of literature produced by writers from Dalit or Adivasi communities takes constitution discourse to the masses. In this regard, I would like to mention some of these writings. Prominent Dalit women authors such as Urmila Babar and Baby Kamle, whom I quoted in my own judgments and work as a judge have highlighted the struggles of their communities, providing a foundation for understanding the complexities of caste, class, gender, and power structures in Indian society. Contemporary Tamil writer Bama, in her autobiographical novel Karuku in 1992, has chronicled the joys and sorrows experienced by Dalit women in Tamil Nadu. In that way, these writers have shown a mirror about how discrimination works. A scholar from America and later settled in India, Gail Ongwe, documented the movement of Dalits in a constitutional democracy. Baburao Babur shared his lived experiences as a Dalit in his Marathi book called Jemahami Zat Zorgyoti, translated to English as When I Hid My Past in 1963. A significant work has been of Om Prakash Valmiki, whose autobiography is titled as Jutan. The word Jutan refers to scraps of food left on a plate, destined for the garbage of animals. India's oppressed castes, who were treated as untouchables, were forced to accept and eat Jutan for centuries 
and the word in Valmiki's book encapsulates the pain, humiliation and poverty of a community forced to live at the bottom of India's social pyramid. Although untouchability was abolished in 1949, Dalits continue to face discrimination, economic deprivation, violence and ridicule. This is what has been narrated by Valmiki when he describes his life as untouchable. The writings which I have referred to earlier present a lived experience of constitutionalism as the experience of law is not in a vacuum. These writings show the constant clash between the social realities and the aspired experiences of equality under the Indian constitution. Several Indian movies have also portrayed references to the Indian constitution and its principles, reflecting its significance in the country's social and political fabric. Such films touch upon various aspects of Indian society and its relationship with the constitution, highlighting the ongoing dialogues and struggles that revolve around constitutional principles and values. They offer a thought-provoking perspective on how the constitution influences the lives of ordinary citizens and the complexities of its implementation in the diverse Indian context. However, for reformation to happen, the initiative is needed not from those who have been oppressed, but from those who have been oppressors. The society therefore needs a collective agenda where the power of the historical oppressors is constantly questioned. In the context of the constitution, this involves the scrutiny of legal practices which perpetuate discrimination. And then conclude with what I have called a radical agenda for constitutionalism. Society must adopt a radical agenda through constitutional means where structures of discrimination are targeted. We already have certain theoretical frameworks to analyze the broader structures of inequality. In the United States, scholars of critical race theory have rejected the philosophy of color blindness. They have highlighted the persistence of stark racial disparities in the United States, despite decades of civil rights reform. They raise structural questions about how racist hierarchies are enforced even in seemingly neutral institutions. According to Kimberly Crenshaw, one of the founders of CRT, history and social reality shows that racism operates in American law and culture in many aspects. Devon Carvalho, a CRT scholar, argues that racial progress is not linear. Rather, there have been setbacks which undo that progress. According to Carvalho, CRT or critical race theory repudiates the view that status quo arrangements are the natural result of individual agency and merit. He argues, we all inherit advantages and disadvantages, including the historically accumulated social effects of race. This racial accumulation, which is economic, shaping both our income and wealth, cultural, shaping the social capital upon which we can draw, and ideological, shaping our perceived racial worth, structure our life chances. CRT exposes these intergenerational transfers of racial compensation. Similarly, in India, there have been an attempt by scholars to conceptualize the framework of critical caste studies. Anthropologist and historical, historian Gajendra Ayutarai argues that in critical case, uh, caste studies, the, historic, the history of caste hegemony and the archives of the oppressed as well as caste-free and anti-caste memories and histories of Indian societies are a central concern. Historian and theorist Shereja Paik conceptualizes an anti-caste critical pedagogy which centers the interconnection between caste, class, public institutions such as education and tribal realms like the family, gender, desire, marriage, and sexuality from the vantage point of stigmatized Dalit women. Another scholar has argued, Dr. Babasaheb Ambedkar's writings provide a framework to understand the pre-colonial foundations 
that led to colonial and post-colonial criminalization of certain communities. Dr. Ambedkar had focused on the value of fraternity, which he termed as another name for democracy. Fraternity means mutual respect for each other. Fraternity can only be achieved if the dignity of everyone is recognized. India has enacted several legislations which aim to protect the dignity of the oppressed communities. Such frameworks are necessary for expanding the discourse on constitutionalism. In that sense, the social life of the constitution is about fostering a culture of exclusion, of inclusion, equity, and empathy. It encourages society to challenge stereotypes and prejudices and cultivate a more profound understanding of the experiences of all its members. It is a call to action to actively combat discrimination, bias, and exclusion in all aspects of life, promoting a more just and harmonious society that transcends mere numerical representation to create a genuinely equitable and inclusive future. Contemporary notions of justice emphasize equitable distribution of resources, inclusivity, and the protection of marginalized groups. In conclusion, I would refer to the philosophy of Dr. Ambedkar. His idea of constitutionalism was instrumental in transforming Indian society by dismantling deeply entrenched caste hierarchy and promoting social, economic, and political empowerment for marginalized groups. His legacy continues to shape the constitutional values of modern India, serving as a beacon for social reform and the pursuit of justice for all. As a corollary, the social life of any constitution goes beyond tokenism and necessitates active engagement, active listening, and taking the perspectives and concerns of oppressed communities seriously. It means acknowledging the unique experiences and challenges faced by these groups and incorporating their input into policy development and implementation. For as Dr. Ambedkar himself said, however good a constitution may be, it is sure to turn out bad because those who are called to work it happen to be a bad lot. However bad a constitution may be, it may turn out to be good if those who are called to work it happen to be a good lot. Thank you very much for inviting me today. I hope I hope that our conversation on how that is in all of these to all to elaborate in a bit happen. And thank you for acting.